All right. So hi, I am Christian Stevenson with the Mississippi State University Extension Service here in Hancock County, uh, coming through uh, to you through Zoom. Uh, give you a presentation on sustainable gardening. Uh, it's, uh, sustainable is a word that gets used uh, fairly often, uh, and I think it's important that we understand what we mean when we say sustainable. Uh, so sustainable uh, refers to a method or of harvesting or using a resource uh, so that that resource isn't depleted or permanently damaged. Uh, it can also refer to just the lifestyle of using sustainable methods. And the, the very simple way of understanding that is if we do things sustainably, we're going to be able to keep doing them. And unfortunately, if we don't do things sustainably, then we can damage that resource. Uh, we can make it so we're not going to be able to continue to use that resource at all. Um, and what's really important about sustainability is that a lot of times when we think of that, we, we think in terms of the environment, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Sustainability absolutely includes environmental concerns, but we also need to consider the economic impacts of what we're doing. A lot of times the cost is a real serious, a very serious factor uh, in terms of whether we're going to be able to continue an activity or not. Uh, and added to that, another, another aspect that really needs to be remembered is social sustainability. We need to have our actions help us build relationships with other people rather than tear them down. And so for something to be sustainable, it needs to include all of those elements. It needs to be environmentally friendly, it needs to be affordable, and it needs to help us build our relationships in our community. And so when we have a sustainable garden, there are a lot of benefits to that. It's going to reduce the costs of our gardening. It's gonna help us reduce pollution, help us reduce the waste that we have, help us conserve our water and our water quality. Uh, something I really appreciate about it is that it tends to actually require less maintenance to do things sustainably uh, than to, uh, to do them in a wasteful fashion. Uh, and then finally, a sustainable garden is also an attractive garden. So one of the things that often gets brought up when we're talking about gardening is the cost of gardening. Uh, there is a, a fairly famous uh, book that came out about that. Uh, I've got a picture of the cover of it there. It's called The $64 Tomato. Uh, and in that book, the, uh, the gentleman begins uh, as a new gardener um, and just part of the experience, he, uh, part of his background, uh, he decided to actually work out the cost of all of the things that he put into his garden. Uh, and it turned out that, you know, of course, you know, as a, as a new gardener, maybe he didn't do as well as he'd liked to, um, but he figured out that the cost of one of the tomatoes that he grew was $64 for that one tomato. Now, I have some quibbles with uh, the book, uh, not with the, the gentleman at all, but um, some ways that money, were spent, money was spent during the course of his experience. Um, I am very unlikely to pay a garden consultant to come in and help me design my garden. And that was one of the costs that he put in there. And there was a lot of other ways that he could have approached things that maybe would have uh, saved him a lot of money and brought down the cost of that tomato. But we do need to consider cost when we are uh, building our garden. When we're constructing that, we need to make sure that we are getting as much as we can economic value out of the garden that we have. Now, we also want to factor in that there is uh, a value in the activity itself. So, while certainly gardens do cost money, uh, we also want to factor in that we're getting a lot of benefits out of that garden aside from just the tomato or the cucumber that you harvest. Uh, but lumber, if you're building raised beds, uh, soil, if you're bringing in soil for raised beds or other things like that, um, cost of fertilization, uh, purchasing the plants, uh, all of the pesticides that you might use uh, for in insects or fungi or weeds. Uh, and also labor is something that needs to be factored uh, into those costs. So what we want to do 
So we want to look at those costs and see how we can reduce that so that we are making our garden more affordable. So there are a lot of ways that we can approach reducing those costs. We can compost to reduce our soil costs because compost is going to provide us some really wonderful, healthy soil in order to, uh, to reduce that cost. We're not going to have to bring it in. Uh, making sure we're selecting varieties of plants that have good re plant resistances, uh, that are going to produce more, that are suitable for our area, and that help us not have to use uh, pesticides so often, uh, so that we're having less problems with insects and less problems with disease. Uh, rather than going out and purchasing those plants, you now there's nothing wrong with buying transplants, I do it all the time, uh, but if we're interested in saving money, saving seeds and growing plants from those seeds is a great way, way to uh, reduce cost. Um, we also want to um, include pest prevention as a part of our plan for our garden, uh, incorporating cultural practices that are going to reduce pest pressure, uh, help us not only save money by reducing our applications of pesticides, but also have some environmental benefits in there. And of course, using recycled materials when we can, uh, that can reduce costs. And again, that, that's something that instead of going into a landfill, uh, is going right back into our garden. So we're going to start off just really quickly discussing some of these topics. I'm going to go into a lot more detail uh, about composting next Monday when I'm talking about soils. But composting is a wonderful method of taking a waste material and turning it into something that is really useful for your garden. So compost is just partially decomposed really organic material mixed with soil. Uh, and because it has all of that organic matter in it, uh, it can improve our soil structure, improve our soil fertility, and improve, improve the water and nutrient holding capacity of our soil. Uh, here in Mississippi, a lot of times when we're dealing with soils and gardens, we either have a soil that's, got, that's too sandy or we have a soil that has too much clay. And the answer, really, either direction is to add organic matter to really improve the structure of that soil. Uh, so in terms of using compost, all we do is we mix that directly into the garden soil. We can use it as a mulching material. Uh, and then we mix that in after the growing season. And it's really wonderful for the growing of our plants, the health of our soils. And compost essentially never goes bad. Uh, so you can handle that and store it for long periods. It's never something that's going to go away. So the benefit of compost comes in its value as a soil conditioner. Again, it's increasing that water holding capacity, reducing the frequency, how often you're going to need to water, improves those sandier clay soils. Uh, it includes some of the plant nutrients that those plants need. So they're returning that right back into the plants. And those nutrients are in a form that is slowly released, much less subject to leaching than a, a traditional mineral fertilizer. Um, in addition to reducing cost and improving our soil, there's a lot of environmental benefit that comes along with composting. I remember from back in the 80s, we were, uh, I was uh, very frequently told we needed to worry about what was going into our landfills, how much volume we were putting in, uh, and a lot of what we're taking into our landfills is organic waste materials, things like grass clippings, leaves, and yard wastes, and kitchen wastes, uh, make up about 30% of the materials that are going into our landfills. In fact, the U.S. Composting Council said that about 67% of what we're sending into a landfill could actually be composted. So composting is an ecologically sensible a really environmental safe way to use those organic waste materials, save that space in our landfills, and get something that's going to be great for your garden. Your finished compost is really just ready to use. Uh, of course, we're going to talk all about the process of composting next Monday, uh, but when compost is finished, it's just going to be uh, this nice, dark, crumbly material with kind of an earthy smell to it. Usually the process of composting is going to take about six months. And it's going to have gone through a process of heating as bacteria and fungi work in the soil to produce that good, healthy compost that you're going to have. 
And again, after this, once you have that finished compost, you can store that for long periods of time or integrate it right into your garden. So moving on from composting, I want to talk a little bit about collecting seeds from out of your garden. Uh, and I want to begin with just a little quick note that you want to make sure when you're collecting seeds uh, that you collect seeds. And in some instances, you have, pl uh, you have plants that will have seeds that produce the same plant that they come from. In some instances, uh, and I, I think primarily about tomatoes here, and again, I'm going to be talking about that on Thursday, um, but some, cl some classes of tomatoes or some varieties of tomatoes are going to produce seed that produce essentially the same plant. Others, you're going to get some combination of their parent plant. So know the plants and varieties that you're using because that can be really helpful when you're talking about collecting seeds. So when you are collecting seeds, you do want to make sure that you're collecting mature seeds. Because that's, well, that's what's going to end up being viable. So you don't want to collect seeds from young fruits. And a good example of that, uh, sometimes we harvest a, a vegetable, which is really a fruit, uh, prior to when it would actually be fully mature. The example I always like to use for that is cucumbers. If you think about a cucumber, all of the seeds inside that cucumber are really tiny and soft. They're not mature yet. So if you want to have seeds that you can collect from those, you need to make sure that that, uh, that vegetable actually grows all the way out until it matures. I also want to make sure when you're collecting seeds, you collect seeds from healthy plants. There are some diseases that can actually spread by seed. Um, so you don't want to do that. So make sure your plants are healthy when you collect the seeds from them. Um, and so you also want to make sure um, that when you collect seeds, we're going to get seeds from several different plants. So we don't all have one, you know, one parent for all of the plants that we're going to grow in our garden. We still want a really good wide gene pool, a little bit of variation in that, because that's going to help us defend against pests and diseases. And now when we're talking about fleshy fruit, and this would be things like tomatoes and cucumber, when you take that fleshy fruit, when you squeeze or scoop the insides of the vegetable out into a container and just leave it to ferment. Let it sit there uh, right in the open air uh, for three to five days. And that, uh, all of that, you know, sugars, everything, you're gonna go to work. You'll actually see some mold that forms on the top of that material. Uh, but what that's gonna do is gonna make sure all those seeds are fully mature. So you can take, after three to five days, take a large spoon, scoop up all, off of that mold and throw it away, throw it into your compost bin, um, and then add a little bit of water and stir it really thoroughly. And it's also a really great test to ensure that the seeds that you're gonna be storing are gonna be uh, viable, because the viable seeds are going to sink to the bottom and all the rest, if they're floating on the top, you can get rid of those. Um, take the seeds, you're going to want to dry them, so put them in a tray or in a container, you know, put them all out on some newspaper in a shady windowsill. You don't want to put them directly in the direct sun, and you certainly don't want to use an oven uh, to dry them out. You just want them to dry slowly. If we dry them too quickly, the seeds can crack and we want to avoid that. Um, so give them a stir every now and again. Uh, make sure they've dried evenly all over and they'll be ready to go ahead and be stored. Now when we're talking about dry seeds, uh, these are seeds, generally what we're going to want to do for this is let the seeds dry on the plant. So things like beans work really well for this. Uh, as the seeds start to look mature, again if you have a pod, as the pod is starting to dry down and turn a little brown, you can put a little paper bag around those seed heads attach it right to the, uh, to the stem of the plant, and anything, if the pod breaks open to allow those seed to fall out, you'll catch them in the little bag. Uh, and generally what we can do then is you can separate the seeds. You can use a screen or a sifter if you want to. Um, I wind up uh, more often than not just going in and picking the seeds out that I'm gonna save uh, and getting ready. And the fortunate thing is those are already dried already ready to be stored away. Uh, now it is important when we think about uh, our vegetables, if we want to keep the variety that we're using exactly the way we want it, we need to pay attention to how vegetables are pollinated a little bit. 
and different vegetables can be pollinated in different ways. Some of them are pollinated by air, uh, some of them are pollinated by insects, and some of them are self-pollinated. So tomatoes are a really good example of that. Um, you don't have a self-pollinated variety. You can keep different varieties of tomatoes right next to themselves. They tend to just take care of themselves. You, you don't have to worry about the varieties crossing too much. So uh, when you talk about something that's insect borne, those insects can carry that pollen for a quarter of a mile. Uh, so very likely within the area of your garden, if you do have a mixture of different varieties, the seed that you get may wind up being a mixture of the varieties that you, uh, that you have. Uh, and then with airborne plants like, uh, airborne pollinated plants like corn, um, though that pollen can potentially move for a mile before it reaches the, uh, uh, where it's pollinating. Um, so uh, again, it's very easy to get a mixed variety. And so if you are trying to save seed and you're really particular about your variety, uh, make sure you think about this because we, uh, we want to keep that variety the same as it was for you. Now storing seed, very simple to do. Just need to make sure you're maintaining them ideally under cool and dry conditions. Uh, if you've had them under a wildly fluctu uh, fluctuating temperature, and, and even more so if they've been under a wildly fluctuating humidity, uh, that can really damage the seed. Uh, it can either uh, cause them to break dormancy, and once that happens, they, they try, to, try to get going and germinating, and then, then they, uh, they just die off, uh, or it can just damage them uh, uh, directly. Uh, and truth be told, often I'm, I'm not going to throw these seed away. I am just going to accept that if they've not been held under really ideal conditions, the germination rate for those seed is just not going to be quite as good. Uh, and the longer we're storing them, the more important it is to control, control moisture levels, to control temperature conditions. Uh, low moisture content, content is going to give that seed a longer life, especially if we're uh, keeping them at a warm temperature. Now, I keep my uh, seeds in a little refrigerator that I have specially for that. Um, I don't expect everybody to do that, uh, but it's a great way to do it. And you can keep seeds in your own refrigerator and that works really well. Another thing that you can do uh, is to uh, make sure that you're keeping that humidity down. Uh, you can store your seeds over, but, but not in direct content uh, with a drying agent like calcium chloride or even powdered milk. Uh, my favorite thing to use uh, whenever I uh, buy a pair of shoes or if uh, my wife gets a purse, um, you, you get those little silica gel packets uh, that come with those uh, products uh, and that works very well as something to add into um, the, uh, uh, the to the container for the seed in order to keep the uh, keep the moisture level down all right uh, do keep in mind you can't over dry things so you want to make sure that they uh, again stayed out of direct contact with that uh, uh, with that seed um, you can store, store your seeds uh, really ideally between the temperature of 40 and 50 degrees uh, that works very well uh, in our uh, refrigerator that is not my refrigerator in the picture uh, but uh, for even longer term storage you can put your seeds in the freezer uh, if you look down at the bottom picture there, um, that is a picture of the seed, of the seed, bar, seed vault in Svalbard, uh, which is way up north above the Ar Arctic Circle, and they actually store seeds at really low temperatures uh, to potentially use them after some sort of disaster. Uh, so uh, seeds can be kept at those low temperatures for a long period of time. Uh, you do want to keep your seeds away from any fruits or vegetables uh, that are giving off a, a gas called ethylene as they ripen. Bananas are really uh, kind of famous for this uh, because that ethylene production can actually damage the seeds. Uh, but again, keep in mind if they're properly dried before storing, uh, you do want to let them come up to room temperature before handling them just to make sure you're not damaging them from being too cold. Now, you can keep seeds for multiple years. 
this is just a partial chart of some seed, the duration. Some seeds can be kept as long as they're kept under cool, dry conditions. Uh, my favorite one on there, tomatoes. I, I have absolutely kept tomato seeds for four or five years. Uh, kind of at the lower end is corn and okra. They tend to be, uh, they tend to go bad a little bit quicker. Uh, but you can see a lot of our seed can really be kept for multiple years and still be perfectly viable. When we are trying to germinate our seed, uh, we do want to make sure that we have higher temperatures. Uh, seed germinate best between 75 and 80 degrees. So it's a good idea to uh, have your seed germinating um, in, a, uh, in a controlled environment area. Inside your house is perfectly fine. So in a windowsill works just great. Uh, make sure that you're giving them proper moisture. Um, and you can actually soak them, and you can see the picture there with some bean seeds, or pea seeds rather, added into a mason jar. Uh, that's actually going to improve germination. Uh, and then you want to make sure you use a, a, a good uh, media or soil media for starting your seeds. Uh, things like core work very well. That's a coconut husk material because it's very light and allows that air movement in there to get the, uh, the, the seed as healthy as it possibly can. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about pest prevention as well, another aspect of doing things sustainably. Uh, we do want to protect from our insects and our diseases because damage from them can be pretty significant. Um, and our cultural practices, ways we grow our plants, can really greatly reduce this damage and reduce the amount of time and energy and money we're going to need to put into managing our managing insects and disease pests. Uh, I did recently give a, a presentation on uh, on Zoom uh, for managing an in insect and disease pest. I encourage you if you weren't able to attend that, I'm going to break that video down into two parts uh, and put that up on the YouTube channel. Um, so you can uh, go and get that information. Uh, so what I like to, uh, to advance is the, the best method for approaching pest management, whether that be insects or diseases or weeds, is the idea of what we call integrated pest management. Uh, and the, really, uh, the idea of integrated pest management is that rather than relying on a single method of management, we are going to use multiple methods. We're going to try to get as many different ways to defend ourselves against those pests as we possibly can, because that one individual control method might not be effective, or it might not be cost effective, uh, and it also may not be the best for the environment. So combining all those control practices, not only is it going to be more efficient, but it can also cost less, uh, be a lot less labor, uh, and take care of our environment at the same time. One of the things that's really important for integrated pest management is actually monitoring for the pests that we're worried about. Uh, and this is not a, a terribly onerous thing to do. I think one of my favorite things to do is to go out and spend time in my garden. Um, so going out into your garden, uh, walking around it, looking for any uh, sign of insects or disease coming in. Uh, I recommend doing that at least twice per week, but you know, I would love to see everybody having the time to walk around their garden every single day. Uh, not only are you going to be able to keep an eye on the population levels of any uh, possible pests, um, but you're also going to have the positive experience of going out there and watching your garden grow. Another thing that I think is really important when we're talking about managing pests is not only to do it, but after we do it, to write it down. Uh, so keeping a notebook or a file on your computer that gives you a record of what you've done in terms of managing pests and what you've done with your garden entirely, it's a really good way not only to kind of be able to look back at those experiences, uh, but also over time, you'll notice that you do tend to see some of the same problems crop up again and again. And so you can look back at your notes from a previous thing, kind of see, well, you know, this problem tended to show up about this time, so you can be prepared for it. Uh, one important part of sustainability, and particularly dealing with pests, is to make sure that we're selecting plants that are really well suited to our environment, 
as well as pl uh, plants that are going to be uh, resistant to particular pests. Uh, so you can see some examples there. I have a, an example of a variety of peas and a variety of beans. Uh, one of those uh, peas is resistant to wilt, uh, and one of them is resistant, to the uh, beans are resistant to uh, rust. So it gives you an idea, you know, if you've had a history of that kind of problem, that's something that you can include as a way to reduce the problems that you're going to have. Um, so also keep in mind, we do want, want to look at varieties that are adapted to our climate. You know, most of our vegetable species are going to be adapted to right here in Mississippi and do a fantastic job here. Um, but some particular varieties may be a little bit more tolerant of heat. You know, selecting those things, if we know we have those conditions, it's just going to make us a little bit more successful in our garden. Uh, of course, I, I spent a fair amount of time talking about this in, uh, in my presentation on increasing diversity uh, to uh, deal with plant pests. So I also encourage you to go back and take a look at that. Uh, but attracting insect predators, attracting beneficial insects is a potentially really good way to reduce some of the impact of those pest insects that we have. So lady beetles, other beneficial insects, we can grow, attract those by growing a diversity of plants in the garden, things like dill and fennel. I always tell people the best way is to have that herb garden right there in your vegetable garden, um, because that's gonna draw in those insect uh, predators, beneficial insects that are gonna help you out. You also wanna potentially attract insect eating birds. Uh, we can attract those with a, a suet cake. Uh, they have suet cakes for, you know, that are insect suet cakes. Uh, but we don't necessarily want to attract the, uh, the fruit-eating birds into our gardens as well. Uh, and I always encur encourage people to include native plants. Uh, you can do that with a wildflower planting in the center of your vegetable garden. Uh, you can do that with what we call refugia around the area of the garden, uh, which is just a place that has native plants in it uh, that is going to be able to foster some of these native wildlife species. Of course, physical barriers can also be an important component in, uh, in blocking insects and blocking pathogens. Uh, the low tunnels you see in this picture are really designed as much to uh, control the temperature uh, because they, have, they give a little bit of a greenhouse effect and allow that temperature in around the plants so you can put the plants in the ground a little bit earlier or even later in the year. Um, but you can use netting and other materials like that that are going to act as a physical barrier to the insects, physical barrier to pathogens. If you do that, then um, you know, if you can keep them physically off plants, you're not going to have any uh, problems. Of course, weed control can be a significant issue as well. Uh, and not only because they look inattractive, but they're also taking the nutrients that your plants need to grow uh, successfully. They can also serve as hosts for damaging insects or potentially damaging diseases. So controlling weeds is going to keep our pathogens and our insects from spreading to our plants. And unfortunately, we're really the, the most effective way of dealing with weeds in a small garden um, is the old traditional way of uh, removing those weeds by hand. Um, that being said, it's still possible to use selective herbicides really encourage people to use mulches as a way to uh, keep weed pressure down. Uh, organic mulches like hay or uh, wood, bar, uh, wood chips, things like that, work very well not only to reduce that weed pressure, um, but also as a method for cooling our soil. We get really high temperatures as we get down, get up into the summer. And so reducing that soil temperature can preserve our water uh, very well, uh, lessen evaporation, and make the plants more healthy. Uh, so mulches, again, they're going to prevent pest problems. Uh, what they do is they just separate the plant from direct contact with the soil. Uh, a lot of disease organisms can live in the soil and persist there from season to season. So by introducing that barrier, we prevent the, the complete disease cycle from happening. Uh, generally, <clears throat> you want to include about a two to four inch layer around young and emerged plants uh, and, over the, and over the soil after it's warmed up. You don't necessarily want to put those mulches in right away. Uh, in the early season, if we do have colder temperatures, 
Uh, it's going to slow down the growth of your plants. Uh, so adding it in as we go through the season can be really beneficial. Of course, we do want uh, water, and I'm always thinking about uh, water and plant disease. Um, so we do want to make sure that we're watering the plants in the morning, gives the plant plenty of time to dry off. Uh, I always do encourage people to use a drip irrigation system if possible, because that's going to apply that water right down to the base of the plants where they uh, uh, doesn't have the opportunity to wet the leaves. And you're just going to cut off the disease cycle right there um, because you don't have any free water on the surface of the leaves. Not only that, but you're going to be conserving water because the drip irrigation system uses drastically less water. It's not all evaporating off of the leaves. It's going right down into the soil. Uh, it's also important to have really good airflow through a planting bed. Uh, that's going to allow the, uh, the water to evaporate off the leaves more quickly. So pruning uh, vegetable plants, if it's appropriate for them, like pruning our tomatoes, uh, can actually help reduce a lot of our, a lot of our disease issues. Uh, just to have one slide on this, uh, I, I think the use of recycled materials in gardens is a great thing. Um, so, you know, so I've got some examples here of the use of recycling materials, either old wood to make a raised bed. Uh, you can see pallets there being used to, uh, to grow potatoes, um, even an old tractor tire. Uh, and my personal favorite is an old canoe. Uh, that is now being used as a garden area. So all of these recycled materials, rather than going into a landfill, uh, are doing a really great job of growing vegetables. Uh, so I think that's fantastic. So I want to talk a little bit, you know, we're talking about sustainability, so we, we do want to talk about environmental impact. Uh, and I think our gardens have a wonderful environmental impact. A lot of our food can travel a really long way before it gets to us. So food in the United States travels an average of 1,300 miles from the farm it's grown to your table. So uh, over that time, it's gonna change hands. It, can start, it actually consumes 10 times as much energy to transport that food as you actually get out of the food. So uh, we really want to lessen the amount of energy that goes into that uh, to transport of our food. And one of the best ways we can do that is locally grown food. So supporting your local farmers is a wonderful thing to do. Supporting the, far the farmers that come out to your farmers markets, uh, shopping at grocery stores that, that support local farmers is a wonderful way to reduce the environmental impact of our food system. Now, there is uh, no more local food than your backyard. So. If you really want to reduce the environmental impact of the, uh, of the food that you eat, probably the best way to do that is to have the food right there. It's not going to have to travel more than 50 feet to get from your garden to your kitchen. And this is a topic that's come up recently. I, I've heard this word uh, uh, fairly, re uh, fairly uh, recently a lot more than I have in the, probably the past 10 years. Uh, it's one of the things that I'm really excited about is I actually got my first experience in a garden in my grandmother's victory garden. She had kept it over the years, uh, still had that garden there, uh, and I do remember as a kid helping her weed and helping her uh, put away peas and beans and everything else. Uh, and when we look back to the 1940s, uh, in one year, 40% of the produce we consumed here in the United States came from Victory Gardens. So it's clear that our gardens can be extraordinarily productive uh, and extraordinarily great, not only for our health and our economy, uh, but for our environment as well, which really just combines all of those components of sustainability. Uh, so... You know, when we talk about gardening and health, there's more than one component of health. Of course, that, you know, that food you're going to get out of your garden is going to be really nutritious, really great for you. Uh, but we also want to talk about our mental health. And so I, I like to use the, the term horticulture therapy. Uh, just being exposed to green spaces reduces stress, increases our sense of wellness and belonging. 
Uh, the stat that I really like to quote is that a 10% increase in nearby green space uh, in a study that was conducted decreased health complaints as much as a five-year reduction in age. And I th don't know that there's any of us out there that wouldn't like to, to take that five years off. I know every time that I go outside into my garden, I feel a lot better. I can just feel that stress kind of strip away. So spend time out in your garden, enjoy that horticulture therapy. And another important part of gardening is in building relationships. I mentioned that one aspect of sustainability is social sustainability. Uh, so using our gardens to build relationships is very important, uh, whether that be relationships with our community, with young people, uh, with our neighbors. Uh, I love to grow vegetables. I think maybe the only thing that I love to do more than grow vegetables is to give them away. Uh, so <clears throat> having a garden is a great opportunity to connect with other gardeners, uh, to talk about something that you're enjoying and share that interest with them. And I really encourage you to do that. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities through Mississippi State University Extension and other organizations, local garden clubs, uh, that really help you build relationships with other gardeners. Uh, but I also encourage you, you know, not just with other gardeners, uh, but if you're growing some tomatoes in your backyard, uh, growing some squash or some zucchini, uh, it's pretty likely you're going to have a little bit to spare. Uh, so there's absolutely nothing wrong with putting them in a basket or an old pot or even in a, uh, a plastic bag. Um, take them by a neighbor or take them by a, uh, a local senior citizen home. They'll really enjoy it and appreciate it and really help build the relationships in our community. Um, 